Hello, everyone. My guest today is Sachin Gupta. He's the founder and CEO of Hacker Earth and has grown the company to a global SaaS platform with hundreds of customers and millions of users. He leads the marketing team today along with sales and operations. He's also responsible for product management and strategy. Sachin, you ready to take us to the top? All right. Are you ready to take us to the top? Absolutely. All right. So tell us about the company. What, what do you guys do and what's the revenue model? So Hacker Earth is a developer skill assessment software. Uh, we have this technology that allows anybody to come and write code in the browser, and that's used by our customers to automatically screen and interview candidates in their technical recruiting process. Uh, we also have a community version of the product where we allow any developer out there in the world to come in and self-assess themselves uh, to either improve their coding skills or prepare for technical interviews. So we've got both an enterprise SaaS solution as well as a community element. So would you sort of say this is sort of a combination of uh, like Code Academy plus Lambda School? Uh, well, both of those are kind of focused on skilling uh, through structured course courses. We are more focused on assessing uh, and, you know, kind of giving you real time feedback on how your coding skills are. Um, and, and it's more of self-paced learning, I would say. But the intent is the, is this success metric on your platform. Does PayPal hire the engineer they gave the assessment to? In other words, it's driven by the company giving assessments. Uh, so the uh, it's it's driven by the company who's giving the assessment. So they would give an assessment through Hacker Earth, and depending upon how candidates perform, they would then decide whether to take them further in the recruiting process or not. I see. Okay. And then, so how do you make money? Obviously, traditional recruiting firms take twenty, thirty percent of first year salary. I assume you have some form of arbitrage against that. Oh well, we don't uh, charge on uh, say the first year salary, or we don't have that kind of model. Uh, primarily because, uh, you know, we're not sourcing candidates. We are more of an assessment tool and we fall after the sourcing stage. Uh, we have a, a we are SaaS uh, solution. So we have a per recruited seat kind of model. So we charge for a recruited seat. Every recruited seat comes with a certain number of assessments on a monthly and annual basis. And then depending upon the size of the organization, their needs, we kind of customize the plan. So we start as small as one recruited seat and go up to 100 of recruited seats. And which which upsell kind of lever is more powerful for you guys? Charging based off number of assessments or number of recruiters on the business team? Number of recruiters, because number of assessments could vary year from year, year on year. Uh, you know, you sometimes have a slow time uh, in terms of hiring. Sometimes you have a sudden surge. So we don't really want. So to introduce, you know, more predictability in the business, it's better to for us. It's been better to price a number of recruiter seats. And paint this sort of, I'm sure you have a lot of different price points people are paying, but give me like the sweet spot. What's the average customer paying per month or per year and how many recruiters does their team have? Yeah, so the so I would say the the right land opportunity for us is uh, two to three recruiter seat that comes out to about seven to uh, $12,000 to land. Uh, and then we typically expand from there. Of course, you know, we've got the long tail, which may just start with just one recruiter seat. Uh, and then we also land enterprise accounts starting at 100K where they're looking at probably 20, 30 recruiter seats. But the sweet spot is to anything between uh, two to three recruiter seats to begin with. I see. Okay. Got it. And then would you say that, I mean, if you look at all of your customers, are there like three that make up, you know, 30% of your revenue or do you have a fairly even distribution? We have a fairly even distribution. Uh, I would say uh, our top customers, some of my biggest accounts would contribute only to about 10% of our revenue. I think that's that's good because it gives us a little bit more solidarity in the business. You know, we're not at the mercy of just top three accounts. That's right. Yeah. Now, when you add up, well, actually, sorry, before I ask more questions about today, let's get some backstory here. We sort of jumped right in there. What year did you launch the company? Uh, so, uh, you know, we uh, we started the organization way back in 20, towards the end of 2012, 2013. Uh, and the core motivation for us to do Hacker Earth was very simple. You know, I, I, I'm a computer engineer, software engineer by, by education. And, uh, you know, we saw, uh, we, we felt that the way recruiting is being done today, it's highly arbitrarily, uh, not, not based on skills. And often recruiters, as well as developers themselves, are taking wrong decisions in terms of which opportunity to go after. Uh, and, you know, being engineers at heart, we wanted to solve that problem. So that's how we kind of got into it. There's a small anecdotal story. Uh, a good friend of mine who was top of our batch, uh, you know, top of the uh, class, didn't get through uh, some of the top companies. And we were shocked uh, that, you know, we were all thinking, this is the guy who's going to get into Google, Facebook. And he just didn't get through because, uh, you know, the recruiting process or the interviewing process is in some sense broken. And that was the, you know, the motivation for us to kind of start Hacker Earth. And do you remember back in 2012 how many assessments you gave? Uh, personally, as, as no, no. Have, uh, how, how many were done through your platform in year one? Uh, so year one could be fairly small. I think we would have done about five thousand odd assessments in the whole year to start okay. with. 
Okay, interesting. And now today, how many have you done? Uh, so I think today on a daily basis, we're more, doing more than uh, two, three thousand. So uh, <laughs> a lot. that's amazing. Can you sum up? So last year, do you know what the number was for last year? I mean, are you talking, I mean, what that's got to be three, two, a million, two million assessments all last year? Yes. So yes. Uh, we on an, on, a, on an annual basis, we are doing close to a million assessments. Yeah, that's amazing. And across about how many customers are you working with now? So we're working with about 500 customers uh, split in a distributed globally. And can you sort of describe them? Are they all sort of what you would expect? They're sort of the PayPal's, the Google's, the Facebook's of the world, or is there any sort of surprising co- or cohort that's using you? So, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's surprising now. It was surprising probably three, four years back when we uh, when we would get customers who were typically into, uh, say, engineering. When I say engineering, I'm not talking about software engineering, you know, hardware engineering or uh, banking segment picked up tech pretty soon. So uh, actually, before I answer that, you know, a mega trend that has taken place is obviously uh, uh, software. Software is eating the world. And most of the businesses today are primarily software businesses. And we saw why the, you know, the tech companies were an obvious suspect for us. Uh, but then we started seeing, you know, an airline company like a Boeing uh, hiring or using Hacker Earth or, or GE in the healthcare space using Hacker Earth. So we saw a lot of different segments who were trying to build out their tech competencies in-house, started building uh, dev teams internally, and then obviously, you know, they had to build that recruiting muscle, and that's where hackers come into the picture. Mm. And of those 500 companies using you, if you add up all the recruiter seats, how many recruiters are using you? Uh, so, you know, I, I'll probably kind of be giving you a number top of my head because some of the accounts have, say, about 300, 400 recruiters, uh, the larger ones. Uh, and then, you know, on the on the long tail, we go as small as one recruiter seat. So I would say if we take on an average about four to five recruiter seats, uh, I would say five. So then we're looking at about 2,500 odd recruiters um, uh, who, who may be currently uh, active at any given point of time. But if I look at the lifetime of, of Hacker Earth, more than 10,000 recruiters have gone through the system. Wow. Interesting. And what what is sort of like now putting back on your founder hat and like, hey, I want to grow revenue in Hacker Earth mode. What is the key metric for you guys? Is it number of assessments, number of customers, number of companies? What is it? So for us, it's the number of uh, admins that we onboard to the on on the platform, uh, and and that obviously gets tight. So there are two ways you could do. One is uh, you look at growing your accounts once you land them, and that can typically happen in mid market and enterprise. Or the other is you go after a larger customer base and say, well, you know, I, I'm going to acquire. 10,000 SMEs and each one of them is going to give me uh, two admins each. Uh, so today, uh, you know, we, we're not really segmenting our approach because the product is so maturely built out that I could cater to a small SMB. You know, I just got up a call, one person shop who could potentially use Hacker Earth. And then last week, we're talking to a giant who is probably going to use it across 400, 500 recruiters. So we're not segmenting per se, but yeah, our sweet spot is typically higher SMB, mid-market, tending towards enterprise. Yep. Uh, so the strategy is land more accounts and then grow them. Do you feel like you have good control over predictable expansion on historical cohorts? Or is that more dependent on the macro economy and if people are hiring or not? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would say there is a little bit of element of the macro economy. For example, there were, you know, given the current situation, a lot of our customers have reduced the volume of their hiring, and hence that limits the expansion capabilities for us in the short term, of course. Uh, but that also lends to, in certain cases, rapid expansion. So we've seen accounts grow uh, threefold within the same year. So there is an element of macro economy that plays into our business. And Sachin, if you look at your cohort that was active and paying for the platform exactly a year ago, so ignore all new customers out in the past 12 months, but if you just look at the year ago cohort, what percent of those or, or how much sort of churn was their revenue churn and then how, and then add back expansion? How much expansion was there? Right. So uh, again, a great question. So uh, I would actually segment that into two, uh, uh, you know, segment that response. So we've got enterprise where our revenue churn is in early single digits. Uh, and then we've got SMBs, uh, uh, which where we actually go up to 20, 22 percent. Uh, anyway. and not, yeah, and yeah. that's not something that I'm too proud of, but uh, it's just the nature of our business. Uh, SMBs, you know, keep on some of them go out of business, some of them uh, stop hiring altogether year on year. Uh, however, blended, we kind of look at a churn, a revenue churn, which is in the range of about, I would say, about 15 to 16 percent. Uh, having said that, uh, our expansions in typically in our accounts actually surpass that. So our net NRR, our net revenue retention from existing cohort uh, is on the positive side. Yeah. 
So, so let's use, let's talk about this in terms of retention versus churn. So if your annual retention is about, it was at 84%, 16% churn, you're saying you're expanding by more than that whole. So you're back up to a hundred percent. How much more than a hundred percent do you continue expanding historical accounts? Like what is net revenue retention? Are you at like 110, 120, 130? So we haven't hit the 120 mark yet. So we are in, in, in the 110 range. So very okay. important quarter. So for example, last quarter was 106 for us. Uh, uh, this quarter we are projecting about 110. Uh, objective is to take it to 120 percent. Yeah, I would, I would, I would say anything above sort of 120 is really good, and anything above like 130, 140 is just world class in the B2B SaaS space, at least. Yeah. Absolutely. Very cool. And what is, walk me through the system that allows you to drive the expansion. And let's talk about this through the eyes of your current talent, your team. How many people total on the team today? So uh, we've got a fairly large team. We've got 140 people uh, split across about 30 people in sales. I've got a CSM of about uh, six, uh, CSM team of six, seven folks. Then engineering and product development is fairly big, about 50 RP people are there. Marketing is another 10, 15. Uh, to answer a question from an uh, account. Sorry, how, Sachin, how many engineers did you say? Uh, so product, a total of 40, 45 people in the product team, which includes engineering, design, and product management. Okay. And you were going to continue? Yeah. On the CSM front, so that's where the account retention strategy kind of comes into picture. So uh, the CSM function is fairly well laid out. We've segmented that into SMB and enterprises because enterprises are typically, they require a lot of handholding. So uh, typically accounts owned by an enterprise, CSM is in the range of 50 to 60, while an SMB account, uh, a manager could actually own up to 100 accounts. Uh, we you know, have a strategy for kind of, we, we segment our, within these accounts, we segment into uh, high potential uh, where we could grow to, you know, can't really grow. Uh, facing problems, so the, the various models that we've kind of built into uh, built into the whole CSM strategy, basis which the CSM team is then incentivized to a retain the customers and then drive upsells and referrals. And so there's a big debate right now happening in the CSM community on if you give CF CSM's quota based off the expansion they drive, or if that's just expected and there should be no quota component to their their salary. How have you structured it? Do your CSMs get quota? No. So uh, we don't give them expansion quota. So we're in the latter category. I personally believe that CSM should be responsible for driving product adoption, building a customer champion and making your customers responsible. Expansion will happen naturally uh, if, if all those three things are happening. Now, what happens is if you give your uh, CSM a revenue quota, then they are only worried about revenue in the sense, even if you know 20 of my accounts are churning, but two big accounts can compensate for the revenue loss, they'll go for it. And you, as a company, I don't want that. I want every customer is important to me. So we incentivize them on retention and then give them additional incentives on top of your quota if you drive referrals. So referrals is independent. That's like your you know, additional cherry on the cake. But your core incentive structure is predicated to uh, account retention. And what does that look like? If, you, if I'm hiring and starting tomorrow as a, as a new CSM at your company, what does my sort of description look like? What does the retention metric look like? What's the target? So typically retention metric would be in the, so we, like I told you, right, we are operating. I'm enterprise, I'm enterprise. Okay, yeah, so enterprise CSM rep, so we are already operating at, say, about 95% retention, uh, and this is not including the expansions. So uh, the goal that the person then kind of gets is in the range of 97, 98, so that they should be able to make an incremental improvement in terms of our historical retention rates, uh, and that's where their uh, incentive structure would be built in. And then whatever they do additionally in terms of upsell, is a separate, like I said, incentive that they get. Smart, interesting. Okay, uh, you clearly know your numbers. I'm going to guess you you're, you have raised capital. Yeah. How much have you guys raised? So we raised a total of uh, two round, three rounds, including our seed. So seed was half a million. Then we did did a series A of four and a half, and then we did a series B of six and a half. We didn't announce the last one, so this was sometime late 2018 is when we did that. Okay, so about 11 and a half raised to get all together. Interesting. And how, how do these how do these VCs value you guys when you and your founders are on these pitch, you know, these meetings? Are they valuing you based like a SaaS company or like a, a recruiting agency? Oh, so we uh, it's based on the SaaS business uh, because that's how uh, that's how our business model is built. So we're not necessarily a recruiting agency. Uh, and uh, but we also have a community element. So we typically get valued on uh, SaaS plus community. Yeah. How many entre how many uh, developers have gone through your system? Uh, so we today have uh, a user base of four and a half million developers. That's amazing. I mean, so you can sort of email them if if Twilio is putting on a development conference, Twilio can pay you to sponsor an email send to 4.5 million developers. Right. Do you do that model? Uh, so we do what we call as hackathons and coding challenges. 
So on our community, uh, if you go to hackerer.com, so you'll be able to see that there's a developer facing part of the product where developers could come in and, like I said, just solve problems. Uh, and we regularly host hackathon scoring challenges, and those are the ones that could be sponsored by our customers. Interesting. Uh, I just realized we're over time. So last two questions here before we wrap up. Uh, burn. Obviously, burn's critical in any SaaS company, especially during COVID. You want a longer runway. How are you and your founders thinking about burn and, and how much are you burning today, would you say, net? So, uh, you know, burn is obviously, like you said, a very critical element, particularly given the current scenario. Um, obviously, when COVID hit, uh, our our expansion, business expansion kind of took a hit. You know, we were all We've been we've been fairly successful in retaining our accounts and kind of maintaining the run rate that we were at compared to the last year. But future business expansion took a little bit of hit, so we uh, immediately kind of you know uh, prepared ourselves for a lower burn. Uh, that is you know, in terms of uh, cutting down on on marketing expenses and so on and so forth. But in general, uh, my perspective on burn is your burn should never be out of control. Uh, obviously, to grow SaaS business, you need to spend right. So the way I look at our uh, journey, it has been more of a step function. So you invest. Um, and, you know, you reach that level, so you kind of break even, and then you say, again, I'm going to invest. And that's what we've always done. So, again, we are in that stage right now. We aim to hit break even by the end of this year, and then we start reinvesting back into the business. I see. Today, are you burning more or less net than $500,000 a month? We are burning less. Okay, great. That's good. And then you think break even by the end of the year, which is great. And then in terms of top line revenue, again, before we wrap up, I mean, 500 customers at around $1,000 ARPU, obviously you do have big accounts and maybe you have smaller accounts as well, but it sounds like you're somewhere around 500,000 bucks a month or about a $6 million run rate today. Is that right? That's, that's correct. That's great. All right. Let's wrap up here. Sachin with the famous five. Number one, favorite business book. Uh, Hot Things uh, by Hot Things from uh, uh, Ben Horowitz. Ben Horowitz yeah. <laughs> Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, not really. I'm obviously, you know, fascinated by Elon Musk, but not studying. Yeah. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your company? Sorry, could you repeat that? What's your favorite online tool for building your company? Uh, I do a lot of things on Google Docs. It's Number f- just- yeah, that's a good one. Number four, how many hours of sleep are you getting every night? Um, I try to get at least seven hours. Seven. Okay. And what's your situation? Married, single kids? Married, uh, kid, five months old. Oh, well, wow. congratulations. What a fun time. Okay, one kid. And uh, how old are you? I'm 30, 35 now. 30, 30 great. All right, take us home here, Sachin. Last question. What's something you wish you knew when you were 20? Uh, well, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of wish I knew. Uh, in So we kind of started a business in India, and then we expanded globally. I think uh, if we had known how big the market could be in the U.S., would have probably made that move. This purely from business perspective, nothing to do with life and personal life, but then from business perspective, would have moved to the U.S. much sooner. Yep, guys, there you have it, hackerearth.com. This is the tool that over 500 companies and 2,500 recruiters are using to give assessments to their development talenting. And this is after the sourcing step. They monetize, pay, they have customers paying about $1,000 per month on average, but obviously varies wildly via an SMM, SMB cohort and an enterprise cohort. The company has just passed, call it five, six million in terms of run rate, raised 11.5 million bucks to drive this growth. Team of about 100 and uh, how many? About 140 odd people, 45 engineers, 30 quota carrying reps, CSMs highly incentivized to drive that retention rate up to about 110 per Sachin, we're rooting for you. Thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at NathanLacka.com 
forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right, I'll be in the comments. See ya.